Matt, do you want to say anything else? You can say anything. Go ahead. Run errands. All right. So Matt wants us to know what his schedule is and what's next on the schedule, which is of uh, primary importance to him for today. <laughs> I mean, I've always been proud of to say that I have autism because we have so much more to bring to the table. You got people who like play music and they may be on the spectrum. You got people who might be like good doctors, good baseball players. We have something to contribute to society if you give us a chance. It's kind of like a zebra of stripes. No two people with autism are exactly the same. There are a bunch of moving parts to this. I mean, autism is just one of them. It's not all of who I am. I'm more than that. I'm a Noah. I have, I have my hopes, I have my dreams, I have my fears, I have my feelings just like anyone else. We autistic people have struggles, um, but we have to adjust for others. But um, I feel like society has to make accommodations for us as well. As much as people have, should accommodate for people on the spectrum, we as self-advocates should also acknowledge that we need to make um, some adjustments for the other side as well. And I think once both sides start to make that, make that leap, that's where the real progress happens. Well, what would you like people to know about you? Me too. How about even though I, I don't talk, there's a lot going on inside, right? Mm -hmm. Just because you're not verbal doesn't mean that that you're not a thinking, intelligent, bright human being. That's what I think she would say. What do you think, Ma? Uh -huh. When you call someone low functioning, it dismisses their strengths. When you call someone high functioning, it dismisses their struggles. We sometimes go out to the mall and sometimes we do karaoke. Start spreading the news. I'm leaving today. Everybody should know about autism because they have to learn a lot more. They have to learn much better. And they, learn, they have to learn about tolerance. I want my family and friends to see the goodness in me because my dream is to see the goodness in, in all my family and friends. You know, I'm not that little boy that, you know, used to flap his hands or bang his head on the floor. You know, I've changed drastically through that. And now I see myself as a better person that can help others with autism. And now, let's talk about something different, shall we? Sure, what would you like to talk about? We can talk about the... Uh, heaven? Hello and welcome to Building Supportive Communities. I'm your host, Connor Cyrus. Thank you so much for joining us for this important community conversation. And I just wanna say before we get started, I think at last check there was almost 400 people signed up, which just goes to show how important this conversation is to the community and that you're not alone when you go through this. And so we have some really great uh, panelists that are here to share their stories with you, their experiences. And so uh, just join along. Um, you are more than welcome to participate if you want to in the chat. And if not, just stand by and listen and uh, learn because we have a lot of really interesting conversations to be had. We want to thank the Green Mountain Social Services for their support of this event. Uh, we, begin the, we began this event with a clip from the PBS documentary in a different key. And we will see more clips from the film as the evening progresses. We hope these videos will give insight and spark conversation. And we want to hear from you. If you have a question or comment, please type it in the chat on the, in the box to the right of your screen at any time. And we have provided closed captioning for this event. But those looking uh, for the full screen text captions, look for the link from Vermont Public in the chat. Now let's meet our panel. Our first guest is Paul Yoon. He serves as a Senior Advisor for Inclusive Excellence in the Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the University of Vermont, where he provides intellectual leadership for initiatives that align with the university's strategic DEI priorities. He is also a doctoral student in the Educational Leadership and Policy Studies Program at UVM and is a partner with CQ Strategies, a, Verm a Vermont-based consultancy which is, which is committed to justice, equity, and social justice work. Paul, welcome. Thank you so much, Connor. Good evening, everyone. And or Happy New Year to all of you. It's an honor to be here, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation that we're going to have tonight. 
We also have Dr. Jackie Kettleher. She is the executive director of the Vermont Family Network, whose mission is to empower and support all Vermont children, youth, and families, especially those with disabilities, disorders, or special health needs. Dr. Kelleher also worked as the state director of special education with the Vermont Agency of Education, where she oversaw the implementation of special education policies, practices, and procedures with federal and state laws for districts in the state. Dr. Kelleher, welcome to the, welcome to the show. Hey, Connor, it's so great to be here for this uh, important, important uh, conversation and dialogue that we're having. Um, at Vermont Family Network, uh, we've been for the past 30 years uh, serving, uh, well, empowering and supporting thousands of children, uh, families, uh, especially those with uh, disabilities and special health needs. So we really understand what, uh, what children and families are going through. And you know, tonight, I really hope to lift the family voice and perspective through this dialogue. And also, full disclaimer, I am the mom of uh, four now adult children with, with disabilities, include uh, two of tonight's uh, panelists who you're going to hear their perspectives uh, this evening. Uh, this has not been rehearsed. I have no idea what they're going to say. And I'm looking forward to learning right along with everybody else. It'd be great. We also have Tegan Como. Tegan is a Vermont resident who's who has auti who has autism and ADHD, who has experienced challenges and successes in public schools, higher education, and as an employee. They are currently a special education paraprofessional working with students with autism. Tegan is an activist for disability rights, as well as an activist in unions, politics, LGBTQ plus issues. They successfully completed a degree in biology with minors in chemistry and Spanish. Tegan, welcome. Thank you. We also have Tyler Como, who is autistic, has ADHD, and has also experienced a PK through 12 journey with an IEP and community support. He graduated with a BA in communications with a minor in English and fine arts. He is an aspiring filmmaker and a graduate student at UCLA School of Theater, Film and Television. He has also been a disability rights advocate and educator, speaking uh, to his experience as an individual on the autism spectrum and providing tips and techniques for inclusive systems and incorporating identity first language. Tyler, welcome. Thank you, uh, it's great to be here. And, Liz, and everybody, I just want y'all to know that Tyler and Tegan are known nationally for their work in self-advocacy and their film project promoting understanding, acceptance, and inclusion. They are also 2009, they are also 2019 graduates of the New Hampshire uh, Leadership Series on Disability Rights Advocacy. So I just want to start out this chat with all of you and just give everybody a baseline understanding for what inclusive language is when we talk about autism. And Tyler and Tegan, we talked a little bit about this before the show, but I want um, you guys to explain maybe some of the nuances in language that we should be using. Mm. Sure. sure. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Um, I, I mean, so, so th there are a lot of different like thoughts on um, like inclusive language when it comes to autism. Particularly because, like, I, I mean, th there are like different camps of like people who um, are passionate about autism in different ways. There are like autistic people, with, like self advocates or um, autism rights um, activists. Uh, th th then the, there are also like like uh, support groups and like uh, families um, uh, working with uh, like autistic children and um, like uh, yeah, and autistic people going into adulthood. Um, and so there's quite the uh, like discussion between like there's uh, people first language and uh, I mean people first language first came about like in relation to disability as a whole um, about um, like like in the old days of like psychiatry like someone could be called like a schizophrenic but like people said well maybe we should say like a person with schizophrenia or people with disabilities that you emphasize that they're a person that happen to have this uh, like disability or uh, illness. Um, and it, it like emphasizes that it's not, um, it doesn't define them. Uh, now within the autistic community, th th there is a, a bit more like different, th there's a different thought there where th there's what's called identity first language, where uh, it's preferred to for people to be able to call themselves autistic because there are a lot of people who embrace it as part of who they are. 
and and I do embrace my autism as part of who I am. Uh, and I tend to say like autistic and autistic people out of custom for being part of the community. Uh, my personal feelings is that like it's more about the intent behind behind how the terms are used rather than the terms themselves. Like there are autistic people who use both. Like I am autistic and I have autism like interchangeably. Um, it, it's it's more about like like if someone says if someone says I describes me as having autism. I, I don't have a problem with it. Something I do have a problem with is when an autistic person calls themselves autistic and someone else who isn't autistic corrects them is like, no, you should call yourself, you should say you have autism uh, because your autism doesn't define you. But like it, that, that ultimately becomes like someone like telling an autistic person that they don't know how to talk about themselves. And it's like, it, yeah, it, it's, a, it's about like, um, like being, being like it's ideal to be inclusive with language but also mindful of the fact that like people can and should be able to talk about themselves how they feel right right and, and just to, yeah yeah just to uh, add to that really quick i mean i agree with everything tegan just said i had in the intro um they had mentioned uh, my uh, advocacy for identity first language, but it should be noted that there are people in the autistic community that do not like to use the term autistic. It's been used as a pejorative, uh, especially in online spaces, and there are some people that have a negative connotation with that phrase. So for very understandable reasons, they're not comfortable using that term with themselves. And But like Tegan said, you know, it should be, you should be respectful of what people want to call themselves. And I've actually had the experience of calling myself autistic and having a person say no you're 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 using the wrong term i'm like i'm pretty sure i can decide what term to use for myself thanks but yeah that's that's what i had to add to that so i want to like, get your perspective you know, hold on one second dr yeah. kelleher um how do you want people to approach you when it comes to inclusive language uh tyler and tegan is that a question that should be asked up front or is that something that people should wait to hear from you and hear how you want to be identified mm -hmm. Uh, I think I'd rather wait to um, uh, have that come up as how I want to be identified. But at the same time, I also understand if people out the gate don't want to say anything wrong or say anything harmful. I'm also pretty um, understanding when it comes to people having different backgrounds and having different terms that they use for this. Mm. Right. I, I'm a similar way. I um, uh, for, for me, it's like like as I'm getting to know someone, like, how they talk about autism and like how they react to me talking about my autism. Like that often like says more than like the specific words they use. Um, so yeah, I, I don't quite correct people a whole lot unless they're like telling me how, what words I should use. Um, yeah. Dr. Kelleher, let's have you weigh in. Oh, sure. It was just really quickly. Uh, thanks Tegan and Tyler, but it certainly was on my list under uh, strategies for strengthening inclusive communities is that we have this dialogue because we can find ourselves in a culture of silence where we're not sure what to say, what words to use, how to um, how to interact. So the more that we have dialogue and find out, you know, for you know how individuals with disabilities wish to identify, um, you know, being able to ask those questions. Uh, so this is a really important uh, dialogue to have in your toolkit for strengthening your own. Uh, communities. And Paul, before we move on, I just want to see if you want if you want to weigh in on this or if we should go to our, first, our next clip. I would love to weigh in. I just also wanted to note oh, there was a timer, I think, that was going off there. Um, so I think one of the things that I wanted to add was, uh, A, making sure, especially when you first meet somebody, starting that conversation off from a place of curiosity or inquiry, as opposed to uh, kind of like, hi, Connor. Uh, are you autistic or something like, you know, like that? Uh, in addition, I also wanted to emphasize something that I, I hope many of you are familiar with, which is called the platinum rule, right? Doing unto others, not how, you know, uh, we, right, would want to do to them, but how they would want things done to them. And so uh, similar to what both Tegan and Tyler were saying, um, if they prefer to be uh, called a person with autism or autistic or something different, uh, really taking right that person's lead. Um, and I think that, you know, trying to do that in a lot of different areas is probably the best way to, to go. 
Now I want to go to our next clip. In this next clip, we meet Donald Triplett, the first person diagnosed with autism. His community has embraced him his entire life even before autism was a recognized diagnosis, setting an inspiration, uh, an inspiring example of acceptance. Now let's take a watch. Donald is, is not really chatty. To carry on a conversation in complete sentences, he does not do. He's not gonna chit chat. He'll chit chat, but it's gonna be a short chit chat. He loves to be funny. Um, he'll say, Hey, Celeste, I'm going to shoot you with a rubber band on Sunday. It's usually not during the service. It's sometimes before the service or after when the preacher um, pronounces the benediction. I'll, I'll get a little sting, and I, I'll know what it is. Did you shoot me with a rubber band? Uh, uh. Yeah, uh, yeah, I've already shot you. I didn't even see you. It's hard not to love him. I, th I think it's him, not us. <laughs> Once you've been around him, it's just difficult to not want to pull for him and root for him. And in a community like Forest, one reaction that Don evoked from the townspeople was that, yeah, Don's got some odd behaviors and some eccentricities, but he's our guy and uh, we don't want to see anyone uh, take advantage of him or manipulate him or harm him in any way. Donald gave me hope, but I, did, I don't know that I knew that at the time, but I was just so drawn to him in this community. I wanted to figure out how did they get it right? Because they really did get it right. Now, when you um, when you guys watch this, what goes through your mind? Because I think that what makes this clip so inspiring is that we don't see people in the autistic community treated and as welcomed with such open arms and so loving. So uh, I just want to get um, everyone's reaction or if you, if you have one. Tyler, I'll start with you because you're nodding your head. <laughs> sure. I mean... Um... I, I think it's a really interesting part of the documentary that this is the first person to ever be diagnosed with autism. And uh, there are some like conversations in the disability community about integrated education and having people with disabilities involved in general education classrooms. And while we don't really see this in this clip necessarily, uh, we, we learned that uh, Donald has had an integrated education experience. And considering he's the first person to ever be diagnosed with autism, it's astounding to show how positive that is. And, and when, I, when I'm talking about integrated education, I mean, uh, you know, people with disabilities being uh, placed in general education classrooms with proper accommodations, and rather than having uh, all students with disabilities in separate special education classrooms. And uh, the, the, the belief is that integrated education can help encourage empathy and encourage people to get to know people with disabilities and it, it, they'll be more properly integrated into community. And yeah, I think this shows like the really good benefits of that. Um, Dr. Kelleher, let's go to you. Yeah, I love the question that, that, the, um, that they're asking, how did they get it right? You know, that this particular uh, community and, you know, an inclusive community, what is that, you know, inclusion, it, it, is the culture in which you know a mix of people come to school or work or in community settings where they feel comfortable and confident to be themselves and and you learn or work or interact in a way that suits them and enables them to perform well and interact and inclusion ensures that everyone feels valued and importantly adds value it's a it's a connected caring community and we see elements of that uh, with, within the, the, the film uh, so, you know, that was uh, in inspiring. I, I do wonder, um, you know, this was focused on Donald T. And I, I do wonder if this community was uh, acted uh, in, in a similar way uh, to everyone in the community with disabilities or neurodivergence. You know, are they all accepted and treated like Donald? Uh, Tegan. I'm oh, sorry, we were already, yeah, Tegan, let's go to you. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, he, he did have a lot of uh, comprehensive support from like his family and 
that helped him get more support um, from other people in the community. And I mean, I mean, he, he, he did have this like environment where people were encouraging him to grow and like, uh, and that he had pe accepting people in his life that, which, which, uh, helped him, um, I mean, find acceptance, but also like, like they can also help people like open up more if they have more accepting people in their lives. Um, they, they can more openly like, be themselves um, a bit more. Um. And then Paul? Well, I think one thing I wanted to say is that very often inclusion is a choice that communities and organizations uh, have to consciously make uh, every single day. Um, as a former school-based administrator and, and as a former teacher, um, it was something that, uh, you know, it, it's not just going to happen, right? Uh, individuals that make up those communities really need to be very intentional about it. And I think that one of the things that Forrest demonstrated and that we see in Don's story is that there there were many choices all along the way uh, throughout Don's life that allowed him to thrive in the way that he did. Um, but, you know, if you just think about the thousands and thousands of interactions that he had from birth until when they filmed the film, uh, you know, all of the quote unquote right choices that people made to feel uh, to make Don feel like he was a part of the community, all right, built on one another. Um, and unfortunately, right, I think what we see a lot in communities is often something very different than that. And so I found Don's story really inspirational and, and hopefully, you know, something that we here in the in the greater kind of Burlington area and in Vermont really can uh, take a note from. So before we move on, one question that I think maybe might be on the minds of a lot of people watching right now is, what can Vermont do better to be to simulate or to emulate the community that we just saw Don living in? Because uh, again, I think that we try, but maybe we, and I, not maybe, we are missing the mark in a lot of ways when it comes to inclusion, especially when it comes to people on the autism spectrum. So uh, I'll start with um, Tyler. Uh, how, what ways can we be more inclusive? Uh, I should preface this by saying I'm not a Vermont resident, so I can't really speak to the state of Vermont uh, from my personal experience, but I can speak more broadly about what uh, in our country and in our culture we can do. Uh, I think in general, having more uh, education and understanding for, of people with disabilities, what disabilities are and how they manifest, and also, like we were talking about before, having focuses on integrated education, having the uh, a lot of uh, supports in place for people on the spectrum and, and also just like having a lot of empathy and, and encouraging people to really um, understand uh, people that are different from them. Uh, Dr. Kelleher, did you want to add on to that? Oh, sure. Um, community leaders, neighbors, teachers, you know, all of us, we can create community or, or you know, community in classrooms where, where people feel valued. Uh, because of their differences and feel comfortable participating in, you know, forums and gathering social events and in class. Uh, we can, uh, community members can also advocate for funding and other supports for community issues experienced uh, by those with disabilities by participating in, uh, you know, national or state or local efforts, coalitions, task forces, of which we've got several uh, in, in Vermont, where um, uh, where at least in 50 percent uh, of membership on these panels and councils or boards, you know, need to be comprised of either families of those with disabilities or individuals with disabilities. Uh, it's about standing up for people and lifting them up. Uh, and then uh, more more details we'll get into in, into later. Uh, but making an effort to connect and look out for your community member and many of whom may have a disability. I want to go to the, I want to go to our next clip and this next clip, Del Parks' mom, Stephanie is studying the challenges faced by people of color when the system fails to deliver accurate diagnosis of autism. Let's watch. Come on. You want to make this light or no? Go, go, go. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Go, go, go. My academic work stems directly from my own experience being a mother of a child with autism. Um, I used to sit in our clinic during my son's um, therapies and wonder why we were one of the only black families 
there. Um, and that started a question that necessitated answers for me, and that meant taking my degree all the way to UCLA to get a PhD to answer it. Yeah, he was happy in my stomach. He was happy once he showed up. He didn't cry when he was born. He just snuggled right in and got on with business. And he smiled, and he was the happiest, fattest, most beautiful chocolate baby. Yeah. Um, Peanut butter chocolate. OK, listen. There is Coke over there. There's water bottles. I got to know Stephanie Parks through her research. Mama help with Coke. She's studying how children of color are diagnosed with autism. For families, we find a lot, especially black families, a lot of our problem with autism exists in the systems and the people that we come up against. Del Parks, look who I found. Miss Laura, go give her, Miss Laura. What's up? Hey, high five. How you doing? Good. I couldn't get access to a diagnosis. I knew to the core of my soul that he had autism. We had a three-year-old that was still in diapers, um, was completely unpotty trained, completely nonverbal, tantruming for hours on end. We had all kinds of markers. He was lining up toys in absolute grids across our floor. He was um, flapping. He was toe walking. I mean, we had every red flag possible and we still couldn't manage to get a diagnosis. We went to the pediatrician several times and we got the same type of response that most families get, especially black families, which is our boys are, um, they're a little slow, he's slower than other kids maybe, you know, he'll catch up. And actually the pediatrician was my personal pediatrician when I was growing up. I mean, she's warm and lovely and all the things yeah. you would want in a pediatrician, like really, yes exceptional human. That's just how baked in racism is into this system that it's uncontrollable, even from people that we really love and trust. This doesn't mean that there are fewer African-American and Hispanic children with autism, let alone adults, <laughs> but it does perhaps indicate that there are large numbers of people in the population who are being misdiagnosed with other conditions or not diagnosed at all. Powerful stuff when you, when you see that and you um, get an understanding of just uh, the cultural differences when talking about autism, even just from skin color. Obviously, nobody on this panel is Black to be able to discuss this personally, but Dr. Kelleher, I'm wondering if you can offer insights for what you know when it comes to being misdiagnosed with autism and not having the resources for people to, um, to see that and to claim it. Thank you so much. I was really moved by Stephanie's uh, segment in this particular film. She brings up that, you know, everything from diagnosis to, to language and, and bias. Uh, she brings to mind the real importance uh, that we all have as a, as a community and within our educational systems and, our, and our, um, our health systems about appreciating cultural and linguistic diversity. Uh, most of the tools that, uh, particularly in autism, the, the gold standard tools that have been developed over time, Quite frankly, for years, what we were using were tools that were validated on two and three year old white males. Uh, so it was like leaving out, uh, you know, a, a, a huge, <laughs> huge part of our, our, our community just in, the, in terms of the um, assessment tools that we were that we were using. Um, and some of those tools also included interviews with parents and families. And if you're not appreciating the cultural and linguistic diversity from those families, uh, we're missing out. She brings up the point that uh, multiple measures are absolutely necessary. We can't rely on uh, either an eligibility determination or a clinical diagnosis based on one measure. We have to have a full comprehensive picture using quantitative and qualitative information. It's also bringing to mind how families need to be at the ta table. Families are experts on their kids. 
their perspective needs to be included in making some of these critical um, decisions. And then my last one is also, uh, you know, particularly uh, kids with IEPs or uh, individualized education programs, IEPs, so special education, is that uh, it's a requirement. It's also our duty to ensure that important paperwork and information is interpreted or translated into information that families can understand so that they can partner uh, with their school teams or their medical health care providers. Now, Jackie, you mentioned something that I think is really important, and I know that Tyler and Tegan can speak to this, but when it comes to parents advocating for their kids, it sounds like parents not only have to advocate for their kids in the education system, but also in the, at the doctor's office. To Because as we just heard from this mother, she was saying that, you know, she knew that her child wasn't hitting these milestones. How, what are the best practices for advocating, especially if it's your first child? Uh, uh, if you wanted to talk about like some of your experiences with like, well, actually, I, want, I, I, just, I will have Jackie respond to that and then I'll go, oh, to, and then I'll go to you. Sorry. Too. Yeah, uh, sure. It, yeah, I'm very curious to see the the um, Tegan and Tyler's perspective on this. Um, the, the, the the important, you know, advocacy is 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 key. Um, but a lot of a lot of people uh, um, don't feel empowered with information such such as their rights and the rules. I mean, as a parent, you're already anxious. You're stressed. You might be frustrated, and, and not feel that you have the empower to advocate for your child. You know, that is something that we do at Vermont Family Network in education, mental health, and, and health needs is help uh, parents navigate often complex uh, systems and to empower them uh, with, with their rights and to, to spell it out in ways uh, that they understand. And, and once you're able to, to do that and understand um, what the needs of your, your child are, it's you've got that gut instinct as a parent. And that's Stephanie was saying, she knew, she felt it. She might not have gone, not known all the child developmental theorists to explain it, but she knew her child. Families are experts on their kids and their voices matter. Tyler, uh, or Tegan, whichever one, let's hear from y'all. Uh, so this is something I, I do have a, like a lot of different thoughts on, like, like um, how like uh, systemic uh, discrimination and oppression, like uh, in institutions, uh, play into like how like like the discussion of autism and like like uh, how like the medical community and like scientific community have often approached autism. That there there are like 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 the clip clip was talking about. There's like systemic racism involved in how. A lot of a lot of studies focus the most on uh, white boys, and uh, there's a lot of like lack of identification of autism in people of color. Um, and I can't speak to the uh, perspective of an autistic person of color since I'm a white autistic person. I, I did live in Bridgeport, Connecticut, for my high school years, and I, I did I, I could see like like there's a lot I learned from living and going to that school. Uh, about um, the reality of systemic racism that a lot of my classmates who were autistic people of color um, uh, did not get the same opportunities that like kids a couple town like within the surrounding towns that were wealthier and like more predominantly white that could get and um, yeah it's, it's like it's not something I experienced but I saw um, th that I witnessed um, I I'd also witnessed a like my own white privilege sometimes at that school where like teachers would often assume I would be less likely to like act out quote unquote. Mm -hmm. um, the term uh, dysregulation wasn't quite as big then. There are other like, um, there's also how like things play into like, like patriarchy in that like um, there, there's um, a lot of people like point that there, there, um, there have been like more diagnoses of boys and men with autism than women. Uh, but if you look at the uh, diagnosis of uh, autistic women and girls, it's disproportionately later in life and often goes undiagnosed. Um, and, but like, again, a lot of like the, the a lot of different studies have, like focus on autistic boys. Um, and so uh, like people will, are often quick to um, go, oh, maybe that's like this biological component of male sex that has to do with uh, 
autism. There's like the this, the um, male brain hypothesis, which I'm not a particularly particularly a fan of. That's like um, the autism comes from like this inherent like more maleness of the brain. Um, but but like I, I'm considering like the lateness of the diagnosis of so many autistic women and girls that like points to like this uh, skew um, th that um, if if we do like uh, like have a like um, like it, less imposing of like gender roles and how we assess uh, autism like maybe it could turn out that it's not as tied to sex as we once thought um, another. <laughs> Sorry if I'm talking a lot. Um, another like thing is the legacy of eugenics. Uh, in the 19 teens, the uh, United States had uh, one of the most successful eugenics programs in the world, um, and um, like like lots of people with disabilities, uh, like forcibly uh, sterilized so they couldn't have children, and like put to uh, psychiatric institutions, and. Um, and while things have reformed a lot since then, like the, the systemic uh, aspects are, are still like present in a lot of the ways we talk about things. And like, I mean, people will still like call their opponents like low IQ individuals and stuff like that. And um, yeah, it's, um, yeah I, I'm, I'm going to cut you off just for a little bit because I want to hear Paul before we before we move on. Paul, I, I'd like you to respond to that clip we just saw. There's a lot there, and and Tegan, I, I really appreciate all of the things that you were bringing up. Uh, lots of great things. Um, I think, I mean, even with a parent in this particular case that um, was learning as much as they could about uh, people with autism, um, and of course, right, having uh, that knowledge of a child that, right, a parent, um, you know, has. Uh, just hearing about the challenges that she had, their family had to even get a diagnosis. And, you know, what's at stake, I think, for a lot of families and for a lot of individuals once, right, uh, or just to even get that diagnosis is access to services. Um, and so uh, in Stephanie's case, for example, if she weren't able to get that uh, diagnosis, I think uh, one could, right, uh, understand that her son might not have gotten all of the accommodations that he might have needed as he went into schools. Um, and he might not have obviously gotten the support that he needed in order to develop and thrive. And so uh, whether it's again, um, the kind of double, if you will, uh, hit of race and disability in this case, or whether it's other uh, things that have been brought up like sex and disability or whatever it might be, uh, the stakes are really high for both these individuals and their families as well again, just to be able to get uh, the basic like supports that they might need in order to get through right a single school day or a single school year or something to that effect. Can I uh, add too? Uh, yes, Jackie, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Just, just one more point too. Oh my gosh, this is such an important topic. As part of our own community conversations and statewide uh, uh, conversations, we do have data in our state. So um, the federal government has been very concerned about this also in terms of overrepresentation and underrepresentation in special education, for, for instance. So there is a requirement called significant disproportionality where states have to look at three years of district data and uh, determine if there is um, over identification based on race on you know areas of, of either uh, you know, finding eligible for special ed in a particular category, um, uh, disability category in terms of um, placement. Um, so, you know, those data are, can be part of the conversation to really examine, um, you know, the extent to which, you know, why, you know, why a district might be found to be, um, you know, o have, have over-representation. Um, but, you know, for so for, you know, some of the concerns have been um, actually like over identification of um, African American males in the area of emotional disturbance or um, over identification of Latinx students in the area of speech language impairment. But we have had historically over representation of white children in autism, if you look at the data over time. And then Tyler, before we move on, let's get your perspective on all of this. I'm not sure what I could add that hasn't already been said, uh, but I did want to mention very briefly that um, Steffi Parks is a student at UCLA where I'm currently going to school. 
And I actually, after watching the documentary, reached out to her and we were able to meet up and uh, uh, grab coffee. Uh, and so she should be actually in the call tonight watching. And uh, yeah, she's she's a great advocate, great person. And it was a, it was an honor to be able to meet her. All right. So in this next clip uh, that from the program P from PBS in a different key, Amy Gravino shares her own painful memories of being bullied at school. For children on the autism spectrum, bullying is all too common and leaves lifelong scars. Let's watch it. If you were to look at photographs of me growing up, you would for a while. You'd see a very happy little girl. You'd see a girl with out of control curly hair. And then a girl who gradually, by the time she was around 12, 13, stopped smiling. Even though I was diagnosed at the age of 11, the word autism didn't really mean anything at that point. I only knew that I was different and that different was bad. That was the response that I received from my peers. You're weird, you're a freak, you're a retard, you're a loser, you're ugly. These were the things that I heard on a daily basis. And what ended up happening was that the voices of my peers became the voice in my own head. But all of, the, all of my feelings about myself at that point were things that I didn't like. I couldn't, I couldn't point out things that I did like. And there wasn't a whole person there. And, and I wanted to die because I couldn't think of another way out. My mother says that I came home from school one day, took off my backpack and said, I feel like killing myself. It was uh, so bad that, you know, I would come home from school every day crying. Yeah, I mean, I kind of block it out. I remember the people who stood up for me. Here, hey, down here. <laughs> Stand up for someone who can't stand up for themselves. You know, lift them instead of putting them under your foot. So you may think that, like, what you're saying may not make a difference in, to this person, but believe me, it makes all the difference in the world. And they will carry that with them for the rest of their lives. Ooh, that's, that's a lot there. Um, and I just want to, like, highlight one more time one of the captions that was in the clip because I think that it touches on a big fear for many parents and a huge problem in our society, which is that young people with autism face double the suicide risk of the general population. And for females with autism, the risk triples. And I think that that's just a stat that we should all just sit with, especially people at home that are allies and just understand that supporting somebody and understanding them goes a long way. As we talk about this, um, Tyler, I'll start with you. What are your thoughts and how do you respond to that video? Sure, I mean, I completely empathize and, and have also struggled with depression as a result of many things related to autism, but also the way that the world has treated me as an autistic person. Um, it's definitely an issue of, um, like she mentioned bullying, I was bullied as a child, and also just lack of support from the, the community. Uh, the striking statistic about uh, female uh, people on the spectrum having triple the suicide rate um, is, is very upsetting and and, and I, I definitely think that a lot more should be done to raise awareness and to spread uh information and, and and that autistic people should be uh really highlighted as part of that keegan how how do you respond to to that to that clip i guess i just want to get your just raw response yeah i mean that is like um i mean that does reflect um I, I mean, it, uh, I guess a state of mind that's all too familiar for me. I mean, I, I used to struggle with really severe uh, depression, anxiety. Um, like, like things have been getting better in more recent years, but um, a lot of that was uh, bullying trauma uh, and recovering from being bullied, uh, recovering from mistreatment from uh, some of the adults at school sometimes. Um, and yeah, it's like, I mean, I feel like a lot of times the well-being of autistic people, it's not just a result of, like, their own autism, like, uh, how, like, uh, uh, how many challenges, like, 
their autism posed to them, but also like uh, the various people in their lives, the uh, institutions that affect them, and I mean how those affect uh, their well-being and mental health and success. Um, and yeah, th there are a lot of different issues with like um, ableism of like this like overall systemic um, discrimination against autistic people. Uh, and, but um, also like like employment discrimination, uh, unemployment, unemployment are very high among, uh, well, all sorts of people with disabilities, but that includes autistic people. Um, right, yeah, and like neurodivergent people. Um, I want to ask, I want to, I'm going to jump in here and I want to ask, uh, during this time of adolescence, right, when everybody, regardless of what your background is and where you are on the spectrum, just wants to fit in. Mm. What And when you're getting bullied, that kind of just compounds this anxiety that you already have. What did you want people, like, how did you want people to stand up for you? And what did you want to hear to validate your experience during that time? So people on the, the people that are watching can have a better understanding of how to support people that are going through uh, something that we didn't experience. Mm. Um, well, just uh, uh, acceptance that um, that there there are that there are people you, you, that you can be yourself. Um, th there are certain people that you, you can you can be yourself without this harsh judgment that so many people have. That like like, like people just just pick on me for liking things or like um, uh, just like like oh you like I'd be like stimming and they'd like make fun of that or I um, like making weird noises. Um, and it, it, like, I, I, I needed like people to like, just let me know that it's okay to be yourself. There's for, for so long, I was just often like, I, I was shutting myself off, like socially. Uh, I mean, both like due to the nature of the autism, but also because I just had got developed this massive social anxiety about how all these pe different people were judging me. I, I'd often like, uh, I was also afraid of hurting people. So I always valued like how other people felt about me more than I valued myself. And like, th th and that would turn into this, this self-destructive kind of thinking of like, Oh, well, it's like, I'd start like when I was frustrated with myself, I'd start hurting myself because I felt like it was better to hurt myself than to hurt others. Uh, but I, I, I just needed like more people to let me know that it's okay to be yourself that, um, that you should uh, that um you should you should that like finding value in yourself that that it's okay that it's okay and that there are people who will like you for the real you when did you find when did you find acceptance with yourself and find out that it was okay like when when was that for you and what was that process like hmm well, it, it was like this long kind of process of, well, for one, I, I do have like super supportive uh, parents and family. And like that has been, uh, I mean, a huge plus. It, it's always great uh, for autistic people when they have supportive families or supportive people in their life. Um, more rec recently, it's, it's also been like, um, I mean, it, it, so these like kind of negative uh life experiences have affected it. Like, like I had this, like, I had this one job where um, I was like, because I was constantly like worried about like what I could like do and say that would get me fired. I would often like shut myself off, like make sure not to ruffle anybody else's feathers. But like, but, like my boss would like try to like ruffle my feathers all the time. And like, uh, and like a lot of times because I was afraid of upsetting people, uh, like it, it like people would like walk all over me like a doormat and after like I, I end up getting fired out of nowhere from the job and um it, i i realized that after all that like hiding myself uh for the sake of like out of fear of getting fired i just got fired anyway when i could have like stood up for myself the whole time uh and even if i was fired i'd be fired with more dignity uh it was, and, and that's really helped me to like start like believing in myself more and i don't think everyone should have to go through that Th that like we should be able to like 
support one another from the get go to like uh, help one another um, when we are feeling that down and um, uh, to like, like build up like ways of interacting where it's okay to just be and um, uh, that um, people can be more genuine about themselves while still like learning like uh, ways to be like in healthy relations with other people and like um, yeah like like yeah, the, the yeah no, I think yeah I think I think we I think we got it and uh, thank you so much for sharing for sharing that story because it's not always easy to go back and reminisce those stories so I just want to. Thank you so much for being open. And Tyler, um, I do want to get to this next clip, but I do want to just get your quick response to to that clip and what your thoughts are. Yeah, no, I mean, I've been through really bad bouts of depression. And, and you were mentioning before about adolescence. That's a very sensitive time in anyone's life. But having especially issues with communication, with socializing, or, you know, otherwise being marginalized, it, it, it's really tough. And um I definitely think that um, to people on the spectrum in adolescence or struggling with depression, I definitely want to say things will get better. It's not, it might not be great right now, but that doesn't mean that it will be like this forever. And also that you're, you're a beautiful person and you should be able to be yourself without fearing how other people will react to it. This is a great segue to go oh. to our next clip. Jackie, I see you, but I think we're going to stay yeah. on this topic after we watch this next clip. So in this next clip, we meet Jonah Lutz, an autistic man whose challenges are so profound that society tends to look away rather than celebrate his differences in TV dramas and movies. Let's watch. Mickey had this great job volunteering at a senior center, calling bingo. He's had a lot of jobs over the years, both volunteer and even paid jobs. But he really loved this one because it kind of played to his strengths. B14, B14, that's the letters in Abno Double Day's name, 14 letters. O65, O65, five baker's dozens. O69, O69, kids don't think of that number. <laughs> but like many people with autism, Mickey has a lot of sensory issues that can really put him into emotional overload. Crying is one of those things for him. Are you? So when he was working at the senior center, some of the older residents with dementia would cry. It completely derailed him. This is Lila. So even a job that he really enjoyed, he couldn't manage. Here today, dead tomorrow is. That's happened a yep. bunch of times Okay, now. so look at that programming block. Yep, there you go. Because I played on the right one. Yeah, there you go. You got it. Change. You got it. He's been successful in employment training programs and has the skills to do the work, but he still really struggles with so many intangibles. Got it. I tend to think employment is more than about what you actually do as the production part of your job. We use the following items, color sensor, ultrasonic sensor. Working as part of a team, getting along with others, like using the bathroom there and not making a mess, like buying your lunch at the cafeteria, not talking about things that people don't want to talk about. I like Pokemon. You do. Those are what make or break a job. This isn't just a Mickey thing. It's a lot of really capable people who are being overlooked. I think the challenge are all those soft skills that go around employment. Um, and those are all sort of bi-directional skills, so that's why I always say it's almost always the, the other end of the equation, the typical people he works with that are going to need as much training as Mickey does. Error. 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 The last time I had like another like traditional job was the summer. Um, I worked at an autism school watching autistic kids, but like I didn't engage with the kids very well and I needed like really frequent breaks because of like the sensory stuff and I, I would get overwhelmed. So yeah, I got fired. <laughs> it's, I've gotten fired a lot. Yeah, so. So that was obviously not Jonah Lutz, but we will get to that clip 
in a little bit. But, you know, while we're here talking, you know, let's talk about employment when it comes to people on the autism spectrum. And um, I guess I'll st- I want to start with you, Paul, and what you've seen when it comes to uh, getting people employed and, you know, especially as, as an academia. I'm by no means an expert on this particular topic, Connor. I think that um, universities like the University of Vermont and many other institutions of higher education try to be as inclusive as possible. Um, I think that one of the things that I was going to try to emphasize a little bit earlier in the conversation was the importance of having these right, really uh, open, candid, thoughtful relationships with individuals, um, kind of connecting it back to what we were hearing both Tegan and Tyler talk about, um, you know, and, and what we just heard in the clip as well is how other employees, the quote unquote typical, right, uh, employees might have those bi-directional skills where they are able to interact with employees who might have, right, autism or might have any other, right, uh, type of uh, kind of nuanced identity um, and how, again, how well they can do that. And so for us, I think it's really about how do we um, empower and how do we educate all employees to be as, again, as inclusive as possible with all, all different types of people. Um, and I think that, you know, we're able to build up that skill set, that kind of foundational uh, skill set amongst all different types of people um, that, you know, it shouldn't be a stretch to be able to interact, collaborate and work with right, a person uh, on the autism spectrum or, again, for that matter, anybody else. Uh, Tegan, we heard a little bit about your story, so I'm going to uh, focus on Tyler for, for, for this part. And Tyler, tell us a little bit about your story and how you respond. Sure. No, I mean, I definitely have faced uh, discrimination in the workplace because of my disabilities. I had one experience uh, working on a job where I disclosed to one of my coworkers that I was on the spectrum, and this coworker proceeded to tell a bunch of other people at the workplace, and then they all started to treat me like a child. Even though I was 18, I was, you know, working uh, 40 hours a week, I was still being talked down to and belittled. And it's and unfortunately very common. The um, If you're upfront about a disability when you're being hired, people will most often fire you, or not hire you, and um, they have plausible deniability that they can say like, oh, sorry, the position just, you know, we, can't really find or we can't really hire anyone right now and then the applications will still go out so it's 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 really tough and and obviously if it wasn't such a big deal to be employed uh in order to sustain a living um it's it's just really makes the challenges people with the autism face like exponentially harder now i think at least i would like to think that people have the best intentions when they find this, when they find out this information, but, and so I guess my, I'm trying to think of like the best way to word this, which is how belittling is it like to, to have people treat you differently once you tell them that you're autistic versus them, because obviously there's a change in how they treat you. And I don't think that it's for bad reasons, but it still affects you different. It still affects you. So how do you want people to receive that information and tell us a little bit about just how degrading it is that these people, once they find out you have autism, no longer treat you the same. Uh, I think it's definitely gotten better in recent years, but I definitely found um, when I, when I say belittling, I I don't mean just like, you know, you can tell someone reacting differently or um, approaching topics differently because of my disability. It's more so like, literally like talking down and going like, Oh, wow. How much work did you do today? You know, like, <laughs> uh, just like making sure that you have the same respect and same sort of, uh, or approach to, to, to speaking with your coworker that you would any other adult in, in the workplace, I think is, uh, very, you know, it's, 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 it's very, um, important. The question I was looking for was how does that impact your self-esteem? So oh, it's just like when you, when you start to like, because, you know, we all go to work and we want to feel good about ourselves yeah. when we work. But then when you have people that start to treat you like a child, that's got to really like hit hit the heart. Oh, no, absolutely. I mean, it, it makes you feel like, because obviously you're putting in 
all this extra time and, and energy into presenting like an adult, working no job. And on top of that, you're constantly being reminded, oh, people don't think of me as an adult. They don't think of me as a functioning member of society. It, it, it's very debilitating and definitely makes challenges already being faced harder. Jackie, I want to let you weigh in on this. Uh, sure. I mean, that statistic, 70% of, you know, in, of, of autistic individuals are unemployed or underemployed. That's, that's, that's a tremendous, uh, you know, time to be, to be reflective in, in the work, in the, in the workforce research has conclusively shown that diversity and inclusion can un unlock levels of productivity because they contribute to building a happy, willing workforce. Um, multiple studies have revealed that organizations that practice inclusive principles tend to perform better financially. It's you know there's a there's a, a, a you know a plethora of, of data that are out there that shows about in inclusive inclusive inclusivity fosters um, a highly engaged uh, workforce. What I, I wanted to add to is like when that happens, though, it is so necessary for our employers to ensure reasonable accommodations. Those accommodations are there to get access and to be able to perform. Uh, you know, you wouldn't deny somebody who is myopic, who, you know, who needs glasses, their, their eyeglasses, uh, you know, in, in, in that spot. So so that's key. And I'm also I know we have educators on the call this is it's it's essential to have these you know post secondary transition plans for our students that um, you know have IEP plans. This is the criticality of getting them ready and knowing their rights. Knowing their rights should be part of that preparation so that they can advocate for themselves or can be connected with people who can advocate. And I'll do a plug for Higher Ability, our state agency that does a lot of work, uh, whether it's job coaching or training. Uh, they support so many folks, uh, you know, in, in, in employment. Uh, but in, please ensure accommodations. It's 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 a right mm -hmm. and it's access. Right. Hmm. Did you want to add on to that, or are, are we good to move on? Um, well, I mean, there's like, I mean, there there was like stuff I wanted to like talk a bit more about like employment stuff, but like, but yeah, I, I mean, in, in short, I, I do feel like it is important to teach self-advocacy with uh, people with disabilities, like, especially like, like in high school, like, like uh, there's a lot of stuff about like preparing them for the working world. Uh, but part of that is like um, standing up for yourself in the working world and standing up for your right to accommodations, which are often ignored or, um, avoided by employers and i have had some unfortunate experiences with that but you know. let's go on to our next clip which was the one i just introduced but i'll just get us caught up now, on this next clip jonah lutz an autistic man whose challenges are so profound that society tends to look away rather than celebrate his differences in tv dramas and movies let's watch Amy Lutz has been raising a son with autism for almost as long as I have. But they're profoundly different young men. Jonah loves to spin. He turns on some Sesame Street music and he starts flying around the room. He looks like Scott Hamilton on ice skates sometimes. Jonah has a family that completely loves and supports him. They really get him. And they get that he has something to say, like his Sesame Street drawings. There's always a lot of some movement in Jonah's art. When you put them together, you can see that he's creating this motion, like a cartoon. When he is through with his series, he will crumple it up and just throw it in the trash can because art is all about process for Jonah, not about product. You know, I can describe Jonah and talk about his struggles for the rest of my life, and I'm sure I will be doing that. All right, Jonah, number two is walk. Can I help you with your socks? I don't believe that Jonah has a real conception of what it would mean to leave home and what it means to have a job and 
you know, these are really abstract concepts, and Jonah does not have abstract concepts. I'll do the socks, you do the shoes. He has no safety awareness. And if you notice, we have these code locks on all our exterior doors that we had to install to prevent Jonah from wandering. When Jonah was younger, he would find a way to slip out. Someone, you know, he'd get out the front door, he dropped out of some windows, and several times we found him walking down this busy road on his iPad, you know, with you know, traffic stopped on either side while somebody tried to coax him out of the road and somebody else called the police. Wow, Jackie, as I mean, you're a parent of autistic children or children on the autistic spectrum. And um, when you see when you hear the story, like how do you how do you relate and how do you react to that? Uh, sure. Um, yeah, I could identify with a lot of the things the mom was sharing, uh, particularly about the, you know, the, 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 the safety. Uh, we had such uh, incredible safety concerns uh, raising uh, children with autism who uh, didn't register when they heard the terror of my voice as they were as they were running straight towards a highway, or who would uh, wander at different hours, uh, you know, during the night outside of the front door to the point of where we had to put bells on everything because we couldn't afford some of the alarm systems and devices. So I I, I empathize. I empathize, and. Uh, organizations like mine, uh, you know, that's what we're here for is, you know, autism it, it disorder, it's a spectrum. So it's experienced in different ways by different families. Uh, but being able to connect with an organization uh, like mine, where you can get a mentor, where you can get access to things like respite grants, so you can, you can take a break. So you can <laughs> breathe for a moment or, or, you know, things like summer camps, you know, th these are things that we can also help wrap around the entire family that's going through, um, you know, some of those, you know, profound situations where um, it, it's very, very difficult as, as a parent. Um, so things like mentoring and, you know, equitable access to services and resources, it's reaching out and, and getting what, what's available. One more thing too, Connor, is I want to remind uh, many of our um, individuals with autism are on an IEP in school. I want to remind everybody that it is the law that um, parent training and counseling as a related service, if this is something that parents need to be able to be full partners uh, in the special ed system, in the process, uh, to learn more about their child and child development, that's entitled under the law. It just needs to be written into the IEP. So there are services and supports uh, to really help the family thrive. Keegan, let's start with you when it comes to how you how you resonated with watching that video. And uh, did that bring up childhood memories or um, any what, how, you feel, how you're responding? Yeah, no, um, I mean, so Tyler and I, uh, we uh, stopped talking when we were about 19 months old. Um, uh, and uh, it took about two years for us to start talking again. Uh, and then my parents would say, like, well, once we did, we just couldn't stop. But, um, but yeah, I, I, um, I, I, I've seen all sorts of perspectives on like, uh, like different ways autism affects people and uh, how that affects, uh, the, like, uh, how like they're viewed by, uh, how they're viewed by all sorts of other people. Um, like, like there is like that kind of like there's the disconnect with in the autism community of like like autistic self advocates and then like uh, parents of autistic people who have a form of autism that more severely impacts like communication, social skills, uh, life skills, um, and there is often this like alienation between the two that um, like this like response to the uh, autistic self advocates that like you don't speak for my child um, and. And that's where it's important that like, I mean, not, not every autistic person is the same. Every autistic person is different from one another. Tyler and I are different from one another in a lot of different ways. Um, and um, I mean, rather than like, um, I, I see it as this like dialectic, these two kind of like uh, perspectives of like the autistic people and various responses from non-autistic non people. Um, and um, yeah, it's like rather than 
making about, well, you're less autistic, so you, you don't get to speak for like the more severely autistic people in, in air quotes. Um, and um, it, I think it's, it's about like, I mean, having compassion for all sorts of different people, including people all over, you know, all sorts of people on the autism spectrum. Um, and it, that like, that like uh, autistic people who do struggle more with uh, communication are still uh, deserving of compassion and um, and the support that they need. Yeah. And uh, Tyler, uh, tell us how that clip resonated with you. We saw a lot from family dynamics to safety. Uh, how do you respond? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I thought that the clip was, uh, was very interesting in that, um, yeah, you, you get a lot of the, uh, the parents' perspective in there. I, I would have liked the documentary to have a little more um, autistic people uh, represented. We, we've seen a lot of really great clips, but in, in the documentary, I felt like there was a lot of focus on uh, parents. Uh, and not to say that, that's in the, that their experiences are invalid or anything like that. It was, it was just something I noticed. But um, another part of this segment in the documentary was talking about representation and how, you know, Rain Man created a lot of stereotypes about how autism is, you know, uh, people with autism have this superpower or they're really good at math or something like that. And I, while I, I feel like um, there's some arguments in the documentary uh, that uh, I had uh, disagreements with, like, um, uh, but I, I felt like it was rarely important that um, autistic people start writing these stories because they're, they're very underrepresented when creating these characters. Then Paul, I want to get if want to see if you have anything to add. Well, I was just thinking about all of the the love and the labor and uh, the strategizing that goes into caring for in this particular case uh, a you know a son like Jonah. Um, I'm familiar with you know some families here in in Vermont that. Um, you know, this is a lifelong endeavor, right, for them and with their children. And just again, how incredibly challenging it is. And I appreciated what Jackie said about um, some organizations trying to provide some opportunities for respite uh, for some of those, right, uh, families. Um, but yeah, just again, as a as a parent of two young children um, who have some special needs, um, yeah, just again, how exhausting it can be and how challenging it can be to be as as um, as caring and as supportive as you want to be, um, but again, just having to juggle and try to figure out how to do all of these things as well as possible. Now, to that point, one question that I want to ask the group, and I will, in the interest of time, I want you guys to try to keep your answers uh, a little as concise as possible, but also don't feel rushed. <laughs> um, is what does it mean to be an inclusive community? Uh, I, I'll start with uh, Tyler. Uh, that's a great question. I, I definitely think having um, mutual respect for people of all sorts of backgrounds, but also having people of those backgrounds part of the conversation is a great starting place. I think definitely uh, having uh, a, a movement towards inclusion should also be inclusive. <laughs> I like that. A movement of a movement towards inclusion should also be inclusive. Keegan, how do you how do you define an inclusive community? Um, well, it would be a, a, a community where there um, there is easy acceptance of, of all, all sorts of different kinds of people that um, we don't just uh, like uh, put me down or cast people aside just for being different. That um, that, that like. I mean, again, adding to like the inclusion aspect, but, and also this, um, like, I mean, I mean, building this kind of compassion and um, supporting one another. And uh, like, when you do meet and get to know people with disabilities, like being a supportive person in their life and um, helping one another and like, like learning from people with disabilities um, are all, all important things, I think. And Jackie, before I have you answer, 
what you, before I have you answer the question, I want to remind the people that in like the next several minutes, once we hear from Paul, we're going to open this up to hear questions from you all. So if you have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat and we can ask them. If they're directed towards a person, just be sure that you say who the question is directed towards. Jackie, how about you? Thank you. And as an educator for 20 plus years, I have to talk about like strengthening inclusive communities is that we really have to look at our PK through 12 educational system. So students with disabilities are regular education students first. They're everyone's students. You know, creating a school climate that celebrates diversity, designing educational activities that can be differentiated to meet the needs of students. Uh, getting to know learners' interests and passion and, and elevating the strengths, uh, connecting peer-to-peer -peer with, uh, with like uh, interest groups, uh, curricular resources that feature children and youth with disabilities in a positive light. And then finally, focus on fairness. And I, I've been touched by Richard Lavoy, um, a professional who works with teachers and students with learning disabilities. And he suggests that the definition of fairness is really quite different from what people believe. Um, that most people believe that fairness means that everyone gets the same. But in reality, fairness means that everyone gets what he or he, she, or they need to be successful and not providing the same thing to each student. So that is one of our keys to our, our own communities is looking towards our, our educational system and the extent to which there is a culture and climate accepting of, of diversity. And Paul, um, how do you define an inclusive community and what does that look like for you? So I wanna echo something that I said earlier and that uh, uh, which was inclusion is a choice. And so I want to make sure that I communicate that as clearly as possible to everybody who's on right this program right now, that we get to make those choices on a daily basis, whether they're in our homes and with our families or our workplaces or in the schools that we might attend or go to and work. Um, so intentionally choosing right uh, inclusion whenever possible is, I think, extremely important. Another thing I wanted to emphasize that my, my colleagues and I in the Division of Diversity and Inclusion at UVM, uh, what we try to do every day is to empower others uh, so that their genius can meet the world's needs. Uh, there are a lot of complex issues that um, we're struggling with as, as a society and as a species. And we need everybody's geniuses in order to be able to figure out how to get through those. Um, and that can show up in a lot of different ways. Uh, but hopefully uh, what we try to do again is inspire others to really think about how we can empower others in order right, for them to live into their own geniuses. Because um, frankly, we need everybody doing their best work to be able to figure out a lot of these complex issues. So our first question is for everybody and it is um, how to support adults who are diagnosed with autism at a later age. Tyler and Tegan, y'all have lived experience, so let's start with Tegan. All right. Um, so when, when uh, people are diagnosed with autism as children, there there are a lot of like ways people look at like intervention in education um, or like uh, like things like, like behavioral support and whatnot. Um, but but as an as an adult or like later age, um, I mean I mean being like welcoming to them uh and um I, like like uh helping like like working on like uh like i feel like it's ideal to know your rights and uh um know your needs uh that that as you get to like know your needs uh and being able to advocate for them uh in professional life uh throughout life uh but also that like i i mean that uh, I, it's okay to uh, be neurodivergent, and um, I mean it's something that about my that something about myself that I do celebrate, and um, th that uh, it th like it, it's it's good to uh, be accepting, and um, yeah, be, be a helpful and supportive figure. Tyler, I'm gonna ask you a slightly. I'm gonna, I want you to answer the question, but I'm gonna phrase it a little differently. Do you okay. think it's harder to be diagnosed later in life? Because as we just heard from Tegan, when you're diagnosed earlier, you are given some tools. How do you respond right. to that? Yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's absolutely true. I think, because um, I've met a lot of 
uh, adults on the spectrum that were diagnosed, you know, in their 20s, their 30s even. And it kind of helps them, like, kind of look back and go, like, oh, this is why my life is the way it was, or this is why, you know, I was struggling with this and this growing up. And it's definitely um, helpful to, to know that, but it, I think it is definitely a lot easier to, um, you know, get support and have uh, very fulfilling um, youth if, if you know from an early age. And, and yeah, to for, for people learning as an adult about their autism, uh, I, I'd say, you know, it's, uh, it, your brain works differently. That's not bad. It's just a part of who you are. And it'll, you know, it'll probably still be part of who you are in, in, in many years to come. And, and it's, you know, welcome to the community. Uh, Paul. Oh, no, I, I just, I love Tyler's sentiment about just welcome to the community. And earlier, I, I talked a little bit about the platinum rule. I think that that applies here in this particular case as well. Uh, really just trying to do what they would want, right, to be done to them um, and having those types of conversations with them. And of course, it depends on if this individual, right, um, is verbal or nonverbal. And, and there are a lot of other like things to kind of factor in. But um, if they are able to articulate those things, um, really, you know, cultivating that relationship and, and, you know, again, just simply asking them, hey, uh, I don't know what has fundamentally changed in between you being diagnosed as an adult and, and not, but, you know, help me understand, you know, what would make you feel, right, the best moving forward? How can I best support you moving forward? Uh, open any questions like that, I, I think, are, are good ones. Mm. Jackie. Yeah, um, thank you, um, Connor, for sure. And I, I echo a lot of what Tyler was saying. And um, I'm an individual with a few disabilities. One just uh, diagnosed uh, a few years ago, and it was liberating. It was liberating. It made, things started to make sense, things that had never made sense. But things that I needed as an adult was I needed access to resources in terms of I wanted to, I wanted to connect with others who had experienced the same thing, you know, learning as an adult now that you had that so you know to what extent we could find uh you know facebook groups or online forums or you know different different opportunities to have a conversation and and to start on you know unpacking all that you've just learned uh we can garner so much support for others who have that lived experience and are going through it together so it's just connecting to others who have or experiencing the same same journey and especially with social media, it's a little bit easier to do nowadays. So our next question is about supporting non-binary trans people on the spectrum. Um, do you have any suggestions, encouragement for autistic people, autistic folks who are, who are also trans and non-binary? And how did you feel, and how did you feel supported to come out? Mm. Yeah, so I, 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 I'm lucky to have as many like, you know, supportive, like family members and friends as I have. Uh, not everyone has that, unfortunately, uh, but that, that, that is a very common thing for um, it, like autistic people are like um, more likely to be transgender than the general population. Um, so so that, that, that is something that, that I mean, you, you, you can like meet uh, like uh, someone who is autistic and also trans or non-binary. Um, and I mean, as far as like uh, like gender identity, I mean, the, the, the platinum rule really applies uh, that um, uh, that uh, a transgender person knows their own gender identity uh, the best and like um, uh, being like honest about like uh, how best can I support you and um, uh, like how can I, like what terms are you most comfortable with um, and uh, being accepting, and if you do like slip up on things like pronouns, like just like a quick apology, like like when you go like, oh no, I messed up the pronoun, that, that like makes it into a bigger thing. Um, uh, but yeah, but, but always being like open to learn and grow, like like learn more, um, the big thing. And uh, I mean, transphobia and ableism is another like intersecting like discrimination. So that is a big issue as well. So like, uh, like, especially like autistic queer people like need the, as, as much acceptance and support as they, as we can get, you know? Um, 
And do we have any other questions to pop up? If not, then uh, as we talk about uh, as we talk about this, and I always like to try to end on a positive note because I think that uh, life is hard for everybody. Oh wait, we have a question from Kelly uh, for the panel. What changes? Uh, what changes to you, what changes to you? I think it's what changes do you think you need to happen in pre-service teach in teacher training to help teachers have more affirming view of autism? Often the materials, language, and tone are othering. So talking about othering when we talk about teaching and what pre-service teaching trainings we need. Uh, who wants to take that question on? Mm-hmm. Jackie, should we start with you? Uh, I'd like to defer to the twins first, and then I'll, now I'll add on. Uh, Tegan and Tyler have worked with many, many pre-service educators in understanding the perspective that somebody has with autism, including making an eight-minute uh, free film on Vimeo, Dungeons and Distractions, about what it's like inside the mind of a middle school student with autism. They've just done an incredible job uh, just having conversations and communication with people, and they've been very effective. So I'm turning this one to Tegan and Tyler. I'll let you guys Uh, wrestle all over it. (laughs) Sure. Um, Yeah, I can just speak to, like, um, uh, yeah, we made Dungeons and Distractions. Uh, Tegan and I were 14, and we wanted to make a film to show our teachers, this is what our brains, like, this is what our perspective looks like. And, you know, uh, we couldn't really explain in words, so uh, we were both filmmakers. We said, well, we'll show them in a film. Um, But, yeah, it's, it's, I definitely think just, involving autistic people especially ones that want to talk about their experience and want to you know relate how their mind works and how you know uh how their experiences were i think is is really important Tegan, did you want to add yeah yeah um uh, so uh i mean that is also something i i do uh think about quite a bit is that there is a lot of othering language when people talk about autism uh, and a lot of like uh, just lack of like um, lack of understanding of the perspective, um, and uh, like a lot of things like like still like like in these terms of like oh the, like that it's like this mysterious other like way of being that like and like a lot of things like describing like 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 behaviors to look at and like uh, how you could modify them. Uh, Rather than necessarily, um, like, what is it like to be autistic? And uh, and I feel like a big thing would be uh, encouraging teachers who work with autistic students to empathize with the autistic experience, um, and like learn not just what the behaviors are, but like what the behaviors might feel like, what the student might be going through, um, and yeah, those just those exercises in like. Uh, I mean, I feel like that's that's a big like uh, like uh, getting through that like dialectic of alienation of like uh, like thinking about these other perspectives, not just autistic people getting to understand their peers, but uh, other people who are not autistic getting to understand autistic people better. Um, yeah. Hi, if I could add one thing. Yes. So um, nationally, right? We are as a nation facing a crisis when it comes to uh, people being open to even go into the profession of teaching, Uh, whether again, you're gonna be a preschool teacher, elementary, middle, high school teacher. Uh, We need as many people as possible who have a passion and an interest in working with young people to go into the profession. And I hope that uh, whether it's you who are on this call or whether it's somebody that you might know who might be thinking about it, our nation desperately needs right uh, loving caring uh, knowledgeable professional right educators um, and i hope that you know there's going to be a radical right uh, revolution in the evolution of pre-service training to be able to support our teachers um, i think one thing that the pandemic showed us is that our schools are essential right to the the very fabric of our uh, society and our democracy and we need right these institutions particularly our public right school institutions to thrive 
all across the country. Um, and of course, right, we need all of the people who attend those schools to be able to be their fullest selves as well. Um, I appreciate the question a lot because I think that there is quite a bit that needs to be done in order to adjust how we train uh, new teachers to go into the profession of teaching. Um, and again, and that's to meet right the needs of a very, very, very diverse uh, group of people. But you know, in my humble opinion, there's no higher calling right now uh, than than to be an educator. Um, and so, you know, we need you. <laughs> if you're even thinking about it, we need you. All right, I want to wrap things up and um, just hear final thoughts. And uh, Tyler and Tegan, in your final thoughts, I'm wondering if you can just share what you love about your autism and your what you've learned to love about yourself. Tyler, let's start with you. Sure. Um, I just, uh, you know, know that my brain works in a different way and it has its strengths and its weaknesses but it definitely makes me me and makes me unique and I try to really kind of embrace that about myself and I also um, would like to say really quick I, I do try to channel my experience as an autistic person in my work as a filmmaker uh, if people are interested in my work my Instagram handle is at Techno Dorito and uh, yeah I, I definitely think that it's 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 what makes me me and you know i'm i'm proud of that tegan uh so i i mean there are a lot of different things i um love about just yeah being myself and it, i mean it took a long time for me to like just like really like accept myself the, the way i'm starting to but um but i, I mean i love just uh like when I even going back when I was really little, like even when I wasn't talking, I have such fond memories of just like um, like how vivid like my like uh, visual thinking was and like how excited I get in like stimming and like seeing like running around the yard uh, on to like growing up and like getting these really like fixated interests and uh, like get, getting really in depth about things. Um, like yeah after this experience i had at an autism walk there's uh there was this one uh thing it, it, was, it was there were a bunch of this bunch of these drawings and one of them uh like i was looking at like a bunch of the messages going around like derail autism and stuff and like one was like like get these autism weeds out of our garden and that made me realize oh I like I don't want to be weeded out. I want to accept my. I I, I I like being autistic, and and like like since then I I always just like took it took to like to heart that autism is part of who I am. I don't know any other existence, and I I I wouldn't be have it any other way. Paul, final thoughts. Uh, Tegan, <laughs> it's beautiful, right? That you wouldn't have it other way, any other way. Um, I have been, I'll just say, I'll say this, I have been uh, really fundamentally changed by my experience, uh, in particular with one person uh, with autism. I was actually just reflecting on that, that um, about 10 years ago, I had the opportunity to meet uh, a former student uh, when I was a school-based administrator here in Vermont, um, when that student was just transitioning into middle school and that relationship, uh, I believe really changed uh, him and it has really changed me uh, to this day. Um, and I think that uh, just like what was said about Don earlier in the uh, documentary, you know, he's our guy. Um, the more that we can uh, build these relationships, the more we can humanize these other people. Um, and again, just, just right, be friends and, and have relationships. I think the better as a society will be. Um, but, you know, again, I think Tyler and Tegan uh, said a lot of, of what I've been thinking about as well. Jackie, we'll end with you. Oh, great. It's just been a privilege to be here tonight. Uh, advancing inclusion, uh, to hear everybody's stories and conversations. Uh, I just, I want to encourage other, you know, uh, families or school professionals, clinical providers that are out there that are in need of information, support, mentoring, training, resources that they consider giving us um, a call. Uh, I just want to thank uh, my professional staff, 
so a majority of my staff members are are families themselves with kids with disabilities. Uh, so they know it and they get it and they, they just do an amazing, amazing job supporting others uh, across Vermont. And of course, you know, our board and, and you know, our, uh, our, our donors that make our work possible, just wanted this opportunity to really uh, to thank them as well for this privilege and doing this type of work. Uh, it's amazing, it's rewarding and connecting with people like Paul and Tegan and Tyler on a regular basis is uh, best job ever, Connor, best job ever. Well, I personally just want to thank um, the entire panel. I want to thank all of y'all for sharing your thoughts and experiences. And to everybody, thank you so much for leaving your comments and questions. This was such a great, I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them. If you enjoyed this chat, then just email Vermont Public and let them know that you want to do more discussions and more panels like this. Thank you to the thoughtful questions and comments. And thank you to our panel for your insight. I also want to say thank you to Green Mountain Support Services for their sponsorship of this event. This event will be archived on the Vermont Public YouTube channel. Good night to all of us. A good night to all of you from all of us at Vermont Public.